right. Welcome back and welcome here for those of you that just joined us. Uh, next up, we have uh, Marla Rickman. Marla is the Soil Management Specialist with Manitoba Ag Agriculture. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Agroecology and a Master's Degree in Soil Science, both from the University of Manitoba. Before joining Manitoba Agriculture in 2007, Marla worked as the Farm Manager for the Manitoba Zero Tillage Research Association and also as a soil conservationist with the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration. Marla's main focus is to provide extension on dealing with problem soils and maintaining long-term productivity by managing soil health. Marla's passion for soil, and I was just talking to her about this, has, has even crept into her personal life. She is also known to create jewelry with soil in her spare time. Yeah. Let's welcome Marla Rickman. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, the jewelry thing, it's a thing. Uh, and uh, if anyone's really interested in wearing a piece of a Newdale clay loam, you can come talk to me. Um, but specifically, it's not just any soil. It has to be the Newdale clay loam because that is the provincial soil of Manitoba. And if anybody hasn't, doesn't know this, it's because they haven't actually spent any time driving on the 16 highway past Newdale, where, as John likes to say, on the east side of town, as you're driving west, the second largest sign ever devoted to a soil is on the highway. Has anybody seen it? Hands up for everybody who sees it. Okay, that is the second largest sign in the world that we know of. The first largest sign is on the other side of town as you're driving east uh, because they really, really care about it and there's gigantic signs devoted to the soil. So anyway, um, I was asked to come and speak in the session talking about building soil resiliency, building a soil that is resilient to different issues. And yes, this is a fertility presentation and so obviously fertility comes into this, but a lot of times when we're talking about um, building soil resilience, we're talking about building soil health for the purpose of mitigating issues. And so one of the big things when we talk about soil health, and Steve already did a good job talking about it, um, is the idea that we want soils to be able to absorb precipitation and we want them to hold moisture. And that's going to help carry us through situations where we're dealing with either drought conditions or we're dealing with extreme moisture events, uh, like high, high water events. Um, this is always a little difficult because of the glasses. I don't want to stay on. Um, so our healthy soils can also help to resist erosion events. And again, when we're talking about excess moisture, maybe soil erosion by water is one of those things that we're really concerned about. Um, and finally, we're talking about improving root growth in general. So a healthy soil is a soil that a root can actually explore in. So if you want a soil where plants can actually explore, take up nutrients, find things like phosphorus that can sometimes be harder for that plant root to access. It really needs to be a soil that's not compacted, that has movement and allows that root to actually get through. Um, and then of course adequate nutrient supply is important for that as well. I like this graphic around whether soil is healthy because it is very simplified and maybe it's too simplified for some. Um, but this is a really simple idea. Kaylee Gash at NDSU started this. Andrew McGuire from Washington State University kind of massaged it and had this posted on one of his blogs. Does your soil blow or flow away? Is it basically, you know, ero eroded? Does it allow water to soak in quickly? Does it drain? Does it crust? Does your crop recover most of the nutrients that you apply? And are there areas where your plants are not growing well? And if you, you just basically do a simple yes and no answer, and this is where you can actually decide, is my soil healthy or not? Honestly, when it comes to something like soil health, there's a lot of fancy soil tests out there, and I'll get back to that at the end of the presentation. But ultimately, a lot of what the plant is doing in the soil is actually indicating to you whether or not that soil is healthy. So in terms of maintaining soil health or building soil resilience through building soil health, there are five principles that we always fall back to. And those five principles are carried out by most farmers. Some of them are maybe a little bit more advanced um, or I shouldn't say advanced, like that livestock thing. It's, it's older information around uh, integrating livestock and we've moved away that when we're just cropping. But there are ideas to be able to integrate livestock back into the system. Um, so keeping soil covered. Maintaining crop residue, right? Keeping the soil protected with armor. 
minimizing soil disturbance, so decreasing tillage, uh, not overgrazing, just to minimize that kind of disturbance, maintaining plant diversity, keeping living roots or plants in the soil, and then that final one of integrating livestock. And these are the five principles that we fall back on when we're trying to figure out, you know, what can we do in order to build soil health. So for principle one, keeping soil covered, and I'm actually going to go through one and two kind of together uh, because they're very tightly linked in terms of maintaining crop residue on the surface and reducing tillage. So when you're leaving crop residue, you are actually leaving something to help protect your soil from wind or water erosion, something to decrease evaporation rates. And this can be really key if you're talking about salinity. And if you really want to hear me drone on about salinity, I'm going to be doing that later this afternoon in the other hall. Um, but salinity is something that gets exasperated by that evaporation or water movement out of the soil profile. So leaving a soil untilled or covered to decrease that impact of ero or evaporation can actually benefit when you're talking about salinity. Heating, so sometimes we're worried more about the soil warming up in the spring, so we don't want the residue there. But in some cases, in some parts of the world where heating is actually more of a detriment, keeping the soil covered can actually keep it cooler. Uh, surface crusting, so again, leaving that residue in place so then when you do have rain or uh, like a kind of a heavy pounding rain, that residue actually kind of takes some of the brunt of that um, and doesn't cause that surface crusting on the soil. Uh, and then weed growth, it can also suppress some of the weeds uh, or at the same time taking out the tillage, which is tied to this, can decrease some of those weed, um, some of the, the weed flushes that you might see following tillage. That being said, the tillage is also key for managing weeds in some cases as well. So minimizing soil uh, disturbance, this is about reducing tillage really to decrease that risk of tillage erosion and compaction. Tillage erosion is something that makes soil more susceptible to wind and water erosion. Tillage erosion is that one thing that we don't really talk about that much because we tend to focus more on wind and water erosion and want to forget about the fact that our act of tillage actually moves soil and by doing that, we are eroding it from its no place. Now, someone in a uh, you know, prairie pothole country with kind of hills and valleys or, um, and, and potholes throughout the soil or the, the landscape might say, okay, I see tillage erosion. You see those eroded knolls where we've actually stripped soil off the top and deposited at the bottom of the hill? That is tillage erosion. Someone from the Red River Valley will look at me and say, well, Marla, I don't have tillage erosion. My land is flat. There's no impact to me of tillage erosion. We still are moving soil from one place to another around the field. The impact of tillage erosion on flat land in the valley is that you end up having to continually clean out your surface drains because you're filling them in every time you travel around. So there still is an impact to the soil, uh, and which can mean, uh, make an economic impact when it comes to tillage erosion, even in flatlands. Um, the other thing with tillage erosion, again, because it's breaking up the surface, the active tillage, you actually cause those smaller soil particles, it's easier for them to crust over, it's easier for them to move around, it's easier for them to actually erode by water or wind. Tillage also increases the rate of organic matter loss. And one of the things we really want to do when we're building soil resiliency is build organic matter, or at least maintain organic matter, because Organic matter helps to soak up water. It actually helps to build water holding capacity, especially in soils that are sandier, that don't have the same ability to kind of naturally hold water. And then again, I mentioned this earlier, the idea of rotational grazing management to decrease disturbance by overgrazing. So when we're dealing with grazing systems, soil disturbance comes from overgrazing um, and too much, uh, basically you're losing the cover and there's kind of too much mixing or pounding of the soil with, with uh, livestock in that case. So when we talk about these two things, maintaining cover, this was a, a major part of this is the University of Manitoba. If anybody attended University of Manitoba, the, uh, um, there we go, uh, that's the center admin building that was the ag building. Um, and so this was, the university was an agricultural college and this was some of the stuff that they were doing. This is Professor Ellis, who the Soil Science Department uh, is named after, Doc, uh, Dr. Ellis, talk, uh, basically plowing wheat stubble. This was a way to minimize 
water um, loss through transpiration. It was to hold water. It was to deal with weeds. It was to mineralize nitrogen because we had so much organic matter. But it led to problems. And they're problems that we still see today. So sometimes we think, well, you know, is wind erosion really a big deal? A lot of time, we kind of had moved away from this idea of seeing major wind erosion events or catastrophic events because we were treating the soil a lot better. We've minimized tillage, we're leaving more residue on the surface, but we find that sometimes we still get these catastrophic events and depending on the crops we're growing or how we're managing that soil, we still can have these occasional events where we have major wind erosion. Doesn't mean that it is eroding a ton of soil from the surface, but it does cause these kind of milder events, I would say, um, where you do have soil moving from the field, you do have soil filling up in ditches, and that becomes a problem. Tillage comes in many forms, though, and one of the pictures I don't have, high-speed uh, seeding, um, and if you're seeding with high disturbance, uh, that is a form of tillage as well. Tertiary tillage, uh, har potato harvest, all of this kind of thing, anything that's disturbing soil is a form of tillage. We might not just call it tillage. And so we can do a lot to decrease some of that impact as we're deciding how we're going to manage the soil. When it comes to tillage erosion, I just have to throw this in too because a couple of years ago, Dr. David Lobb and myself and John Heard at our session at the Crop Diagnostic School in Carmen, we were working on a slope and I don't know if anyone here was at CDS and saw us do this. We actually... Um, this blue line here actually represents where we had trenched and placed corn seed, uh, and then we ran different pieces of tillage equipment either up or down the slope through that corn trench and could observe how far the corn seed actually moved. Uh, we had movement of 25, 30, 35 feet from the point, the original point of that corn seed. So the corn seed is basically a proxy for a piece of soil as it's been moved. And this is uh, an overhead view a little while later as the corn emerged. It actually made a great visual impact. And you could actually see how far down slope we ended up having some of this green left behind. Now, interestingly, it went upslope just as far. It wasn't a really strong slope, but again, we're moving with equipment, we're drawing soil through, and we are moving that soil up and down the slope. This is all with two passes, and so obviously with one pass, we might not have moved as far, but again, if you're doing two passes, and the idea that you could just go up the hill or down the hill and then go up the hill again and move the soil back to the center doesn't really work, unfortunately. Um, it's, it is something we need to be aware of, though, and something we need to manage. So... Again, with reducing tillage, we have new tillage options. We have high-speed uh, disks. We've got vertical tillage. A lot of times people feel as though the shallower the tillage, the less impact the tillage is actually having on the soil. And the reality is the impact is actually quite great, if not sometimes greater with some of these pieces of equipment. The speed of tillage actually can move soil farther than the depth of tillage. It's more, more impactful in terms of how much and how far that soil is moving. So aggressive equipment um, or equipment that is used in an aggressive manner is actually detrimental. And the other thing is that really a lot of those units really pulverize the surface soil and leave it at higher risk for that wind and water erosion as well. So yes, it makes a beautiful seed bed. There are great benefits to using something like vertical till or some of these high speed disks because it does the, the one thing it does is it kind of makes a firm seed bed about two inches down and then everything else is fluffy on top. That's fantastic. The problem is it's causing compaction at that two inches where it's firm and the fluffy stuff at the top is really easy to erode. Um, that's my caution on vertical till or high speed disks. It does need to be used in as a residue management tool to chop and size residue more than as a soil management tool because it chops and sizes soil a little too much as well. Uh, strip tillage, I don't know if anyone here is trying strip tillage, but strip tillage is basically where you till a center area where you're actually going to be planting into, and then everything between those two strips, all the residue is pushed up into those strips, and so it's kind of like this weird hybrid between no-till and, and heavily cultivated soil. So the area where in that row, again, where you're going to be planting into is very tilled up. You can actually put down fertilizer, deep banding fertilizer at the time that you're doing it, um, and so there's just disturbance that's happening, but it's only in a portion of the field. So strip tillage is something that some people 
people are trying. We do have Yvonne Lawley working at re looking at research on strip tillage. And uh, this is actually some work that Greg Bartley did on his master's project, looking again at, at a few different types of tillage. I just wanted to point it out. Um, so what we see here uh, at this top line, this is the strip till line, and this is soybeans that they have emerged out of strip tilled wheat residue. And so the strip till, it's black in that area. There's a lot of warmth. And so as the soybeans are coming up, they're coming up easier. There's that heat, which is really important. You compare that to short stubble, which meant cut short, lots of uh, residue left on the soil surface, and a lot slower emergence in terms of the, what the soybeans look like. That being said, once they got to 22 days after planting, everything kind of had emerged equally. So it was slower emergence. And in the end, there was no difference in yield. Now, some people will say, well, Marla, you know, I want to see a yield difference with strip till. Well, I look at it and say, hey, if there's no yield decrease, sometimes that's a good thing. So comparing these different tillage systems, uh, not having a decrease or a deficit in yield is beneficial. So they had similar yield all the way across that same year with the data I just showed you. I do want to point out, though, that the year before in Carmen, they had differences in yield with all of these different treatments. And the reason for this had less to do with the act of how they were tilling or managing the residue and had more to do with their planting capabilities. So they didn't have a cedar in that first year that was actually capable of planting through the residue. And so they saw more of a decrease where they left residue. But once they actually switched to a cedar that could plant in that residue condition, that changes everything. Um, and so lots of times I, I lament the fact that some people think that zero tillage is as simple as stopping tillage. And it isn't that simple. It's a system. And you need to think about all the other pieces of equipment and management of that system that need to go together in order to make that system successful. Again, with minimizing soil disturbance, the idea of building organic matter. So we don't want to see organic matter decreases. We want to see it build. And building organic matter comes with decreasing the rate that it's actually removed and then increasing the biomass that's going into that system. So the more biomass, the more crop you're growing, the more yield, uh, the more residue, the more roots in the system, that helps to build biomass, but you have to actually take that soil disturbance out to allow that system to work. When we build organic matter, we build soils that have better structure. And so here, you've got soils that retain their structure when they're wet versus soils that kind of fall apart. Those aggregates start to slake off or fall apart when they're wet. And that is a negative thing because when rain hits that soil, you want your aggregates to hold in place. Um, you want that organic matter to help build and hang on, keep those aggregates stable because the stability of that aggregate is what's going to help you build that resiliency. So, and organic matter is a big part of that. So first thing, stop the bleed. Don't decrease your organic matter any further. And then we start to work to building it as well. I, will, I have to speak on soil structure. Soil structure is really important. Sometimes when people talk about soil health, they just want to hear about biology. Biology is great. It is fantastic. The thing about biology is that every living thing needs a home. And the home that we've given that living thing is very important. And so in this case, I talk about soil structure. One, the biology helps to build the soil structure. But two, the structure of the soil itself is giving that home for the biology to function in. So I never want to discount the importance of soil structure as a major part of soil health. So. This is basically what's the texture of your soil, so how much sand, silt, and clay do you have, and how is that structure or how are those particles arranged? So we have um, that arrangement of those particles leave pore spaces, it leaves room for air and water, and bugs need air and water. And so that is the, the better that structure, the better capable they are of functioning. So this has a big influence on water movement. Uh, through the soil, over the soil, biological activity, root growth, seedling emergence, everything depends ultimately on the structure of the soil. And soil aggregation, like I showed in that other photo, this is your number one natural defense. Like this is your first line of defense when it comes to combating erosion issues is by building proper soil structure. And unfortunately, we don't build structure well with tillage. 
tillage breaks it down, it just doesn't build it. Another thing I want to point out is that a lot of soil structure is not just the arrangement of the sand, silt, and clay particles in terms of how they are primarily arranged together. It's also the biopores or the pore spaces left in the soil that allows spaces for water to flow through or roots to move through. When people talk about roots helping to break up compaction and how compaction can kind of be mitigated by having a plant growing in there, the first thing that happens is a root has to push through that compacted area and then when that root dies back it leaves a space behind for another root. So I also can drone on a long time about compaction and I won't do this to you but if you think about something like compaction, when you have a piece of concrete that's freshly poured, nothing grows in it, right? And even if a root, like a seed falls on it, it's not, it's, nothing's going to grow in it. But you get that first crack, that first weather on the corner of that sidewalk, and all of a sudden, all the grass, quack grass, and all the little weeds are growing in there. And once they start growing in there, because now they've been given a space to enter, they start to whittle away and work away, and that crack gets bigger, and it breaks up more, and the concrete weathers even more because of the act of the roots. So here you've got issue, things like old roots in place and new roots actually growing in the hole that the old root had died and left behind. So again, tillage breaks up those root channels and mixes them up and you lose that connectivity from the surface of the soil down deeper to allow roots to move through and water to flow through as well. Uh, again, so I mentioned this about shearing off pores, so again, Earthworms are making these pores too. Tillage does decrease soil structure because you're, you're kind of fluffing up the soil and taking away the structures that have been left behind by other living things. Heavy clays, if you're dealing with heavier clays, they really do rely on soil structure to help water move because the, the, the clay itself does not allow water to move through naturally on its own. So structure and the spaces around those particles or spaces around those aggregates is really how that water is going to move. I want to mention too, because I mentioned compaction, this idea of long-term effects. Um, this is an uncompacted soil where they actually poured a, like a latex or a product down through and you can see all the holes left behind, those biopores, and then they have soil where they had heavy equipment run on them 29 years prior. So 29 years ago, the soil has had 29 years to kind of rest and relax. You'd think that if Mother Nature breaks up compaction on her own, then that would be fixed, but it still isn't fixed. So compaction is something that's going to stick around for a long time. I don't know if you can see on here in the center of, there's these tracks, like wheel marks on the center of this path. This is the Wadsworth Wagon Trail. It was used for three years only in the late 1800s. Um, and they've gone back and they've looked at the compaction of the soil in the track, in the wheel track versus out of the track. This soil has had over 100 years to rest and it still has an increase in bulk density and, and a restriction in water movement through that soil. So Mother Nature can do a lot. We need to do some of the work too with our management of the soil for proper health. Okay, moving away from those first two, plant diversity. So maintaining a diverse crop rotation. And Anastasia was talking about, you know, what crop could follow what crop. These are the types of things also when you're thinking about soil. The reason why we have crop rotation is because we're rotating ultimately different root structures. So the different root paths are being affected. One year you have a tap root, and then the next year you'd have a fibrous root, and those roots are exploring different places in the soil. So that's a big part of maintaining some of that diversity is planning a good crop rotation and really thinking about how roots can actually work for you in that case. Rotating between those root systems, rotating between the types of residue you're going to deal with. You know, not having multiple years of low residue crops because you're not adding a lot of biomass back into the system if you're just growing soybeans on soybeans on soybeans. But nobody would ever do that, right? Right. Um, of course. Sure, Marla. Okay, so water usage, we're rotating water use. Where are plants getting water from and how are they kind of accessing that water, how much they're using? Big water users versus smaller or lower water users. Water users. Uh, legumes versus non-legume crops. All of these things are maintaining diversity or adding diversity to the system. So the more diverse your crop rotations, the better off you are in terms of building soil. You can also introduce intercrops to the rotation. So 
thing that I like about intercropping is the idea of you got two or more crops that are growing in the same field, but if there's areas of the soil that say peas, let's talk about peas and canola. Peas are kind of sensitive to saline areas. So maybe the canola takes over in the areas that the peas can't grow. So you're almost hedging your bets a little bit by having a crop growing in every area of the field because certain crops will exploit certain areas better than others. And so yes, there's a lot of other benefits and uh, peas and canola, like peas are going to stand up a little bit better when they're kind of mixed in with canola. So, you know, intercropping could be a way also to add some diversity to the system, but you do need to think about how you're going to manage um, that intercrop. And if you want to learn more about intercropping, you should have been in the other sessions earlier um, because Lana Shaw and uh, Scott Chalmers were talking about this. This is some of the experience that Wado, Scott Chalmers, had shared this with me, um, where the peas are standing a lot better with the can uh, canola. I kind of jokingly refer to peas and canola as being like the gateway drug to intercropping because it's kind of a simple way in terms of weed management and such in order to, to put these two crops together. Um, but a lot of times what they're finding is better yield on a land equivalent ratio, if they were looking at growing, comparing it with just peas or just canola, there's a, there's a bit of a yield improvement. Indian head finds the same thing. But in both of these slides, uh, what they're finding is that the mixed row treatments, so where they seed the peas and canola in the same row as opposed to alternating rows, seems to be doing the best. Another uh, interesting observation from Scott was just that the aphids, um, the insect pressure seemed to be a much lower where they were mixing peas and canola together, whereas peas alone on the far side of the graph, they had the highest aphid count. And this was actually just in plots, so they're not that far from each other. The aphids didn't have to get far to move to the other plots, but they weren't interested in spending time uh, where they had canola mixed in. Uh, again, maintaining living plants or living roots. This is also important where we could look at adding perennials to the, the forages. We've got lots of uh, research in Manitoba looking at having short-term forages or perennials in a, an annual crop rotation, especially if that is a legume like an alfalfa. It can provide a lot of benefit in decreasing the nitrogen requirement for the following annual crops, especially when you're looking at about a three-year alfalfa rotation. That seems to be the key amount of time that you'd want to be in for the maximum nitrogen nitrogen benefit for following crops. And then the other thing that people are talking about, and Yvonne Lolly was speaking on this morning, um, was cover cropping. And so cover cropping, the idea is extending the growing season, using up extra water in the fall. That can be a great thing if you're dealing with wet fall conditions. If you're dealing with a dry fall condition, it might be something that you're concerned about because maybe you don't want to take up extra water in the fall if you're worried about how much moisture you've got going in to the following year. Providing fall cover to decrease erosion risk. This is where I like something like cover crops is on soils that are prone to erosion. Having cover in the fall when nothing else was growing, that's a great time that you would want. So those are the two big things for me is using up extra water in the fall and providing cover in that fall. Does it decrease susceptibility to compaction? It might. Yes, you could tar definitely use cover cropping to target saline areas where, again, you're using more water to have to manage that salinity. Can it potentially outcompete weeds? That's a possibility too. Does it improve soil structure to improve infiltration? Possibly. But you have to think about when our water is flowing. So this comes from Wisconsin. And the big thing that I want to point out is that, yes, while uh, having cereal rye cover in this case in June helps to slow down some of that water runoff. There was some benefit there. There was no benefit or no difference in having that fall cover for, for any kind of runoff happening in the late fall in this case. So it wasn't actually doing much for October. In the spring, however, what they found was these areas here, this is either conventional with rye cover or no-till with con rye cover. Yeah, it helped in the spring. But Wisconsin is not Manitoba. And spring runoff for us doesn't mean, like our soils are more frozen quite often when the spring runoff is happening. So we're, we're not looking at this level of growth and having more absorption. We don't know for sure whether or not cover crops are actually going to help us in that case. We do know that there's potential for phosphorus loss with cover crops in the spring because we know that there is actually phosphorus loss from perennial forages in the spring because it dissolves out of the plant biomass that's left behind and it can actually increase phosphorus runoff from a field. So, you know, if we think that a perennial is like that ultimate for having soil structure below it because there's no tillage during that time, is it 
is a, a cover crop that might not have quite the same structure really going to allow for increased infiltration? And if you have questions on this and you haven't, or if you haven't heard this, you obviously don't know who Don Flayton is, but um, you can always talk to Don because he's got a lot more information on the work that they've done at South Tobacco Creek. But there is this potential water quality impact, which is again why I really like to focus on cover crops for providing cover on eroded soils or erodible soils. Um, where you have low residue impact or looking up using up more of that water where you weren't using up water if nothing else was growing there. The last one I'm not going to actually get into that much because this is not my area of expertise, but the idea of integrating livestock, yes, you could actually graze some of that cut, uh, fall cover, uh, cover crops. That you get nutrient deposition through manure. We can actually just apply manure to using that as kind of an, a way of integrating livestock. Great for dealing with weeds. Cattle can come in and they can eat up a bunch of stuff that you don't want to be dealing with and you can maintain or manage some of the weed pressure. And it could potentially reduce nutrient export from the field in terms of that long-term phosphorus maintenance. If you are actually exporting your nutrient only as beef as opposed to as grain, because there's less of that export because it's only the weight gain of the animal that's really taking nutrients out. So if you're actually just grazing fields, you have less of that phosphorus export going um, elsewhere. So again, these are the principles of soil health. How do we know that it's working? Well, yeah, you can do traditional soil tests. I look at these all the time. I love them. There's good information on nutrient supply, organic matter, salinity, pH. These are all key pieces of information that tells you how your soil is functioning. There's also a lot of other analyses you can do in the field. So you can use water infiltration, you can observe soil structure, you can count earthworms, you can smell the soil. I have done it. If you know that smell, everybody knows that smell. You're working in the soil and you get that earthy smell. That's actinomycetes. It is a bacteria that is functioning in a good aerated moist soil. So you can smell the soil and it tells you that the biology is functioning. Um, you can look at the soil and you can look and observe things like the, the aggregates, the little chunks and pieces of soil as they're hanging off of roots. I use this all the time, the slake test or the aggregate stability test. On a government budget, I can still go to the dollar store and I can buy and afford field equipment to be able to take these glass vases and the hockey stick that John Hurd has re repurposed into an aggregate stability kit. Um, and we can still do these things and we can actually look at the impact of water and be able to infer information about how well that soil is going to be able to function when rain is hitting it or when it's ponded and pooling with water. So we use these things out in the field all the time. They are easy. Anyone can do that. Uh, a key note though, I do want to mention soil texture and the reason why I want to mention soil texture is because the texture of your soil will influence the ability for your soil to build aggregates. A sand will not build aggregates. You won't build aggregates out of pure beach sand. It needs clay to stick it together. That is helpful. The clay is actually part of the sticking factor, which is why when you get into heavy clay, it's even more difficult because it's got a lot of the stickiness to it. So the Newdale clay loam, that provincial soil in Manitoba, is this beautiful soil with equal parts of sand, silt, and clay. And so it has a, an easy ability to build up those aggregates. And so we do need to consider texture and you never want to compare the health of a clay soil with the health of a sandy soil because it's an inappropriate comparison because they can't achieve the same things because they're limited by their texture. Uh, John, Don already showed this. Uh, it's the same idea as this is a test. This is a soil health test that I see on Twitter all the time. You know what? I've never been able to recreate the results that I see on Twitter because every time I do it, that darn corn crop ends up looking so good and it chews up the underwear and it chews up the underwear as Don talked about because there's good aeration, there's good nitrogen, you've got great mineralization happening um, and you're going to break down residue a lot faster in that case. So keep in mind that sometimes tests you have to think about why they work in order to figure out if they're actually telling you the story that you're looking for. And I do, just to wrap up, want to mention that there is the Soil Health Institute. They have endorsed a number of what they call tier one measures measurements. These are endorsed as measurements that have consistency and an understanding of how we can actually use these measures for the purpose of actually making recommendations or being able to kind of have an idea of how the soil is functioning. The problem is some of these, like mineralization, are more maybe less predictable for us here in Manitoba because our soils 
are frozen for half of the year and we need warmth in order to have mineralization because it really functions based on biology. So even when we have these tiers, we have to think about the fact that the regionality of where these tools are developed don't always immediately work where we're where we are, we need to validate that they work here and ground truth them first. So it is extremely important to test that there are treatment differences and make sure that these treatments are stable over time because our soils are regional and like specific and these tests sometimes are regional specific too. They are doing a further study on tier two. So some of the other soil health tests that you often hear about are still on the tier two. It means that they have to make sure that the methodology is clear, that they'll get the same result every time. And we actually know how we can use this information before it would actually get moved on to the tier one list. So they are testing these and looking at some of these measurements, but these measurements at this current time are not ready Ready for prime time. We don't know how to use this information in order to make decisions with it. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about soil health, just to wrap up here, we've got a bit of, this is a plug for something that we're working on with the University of Manitoba, as well as with our department, Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. We are working on developing a soil health course for people to take. It would, looks like it's probably going to be a two-day course, not unlike the soil health workshops that John organizes. And we really want to bring some good science-based and regionally appropriate information to farmers and agronomists in Manitoba to basically come up with how we can use these Manitoba-made solutions for building soil health over time. So with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I don't know if we have time for questions, you can always follow me as I run to the other room to set up my presentation down there. <laughs>